All right, welcome to day 16. And today is really kind of a, a deep dive in industrial properties and some considerations or factors. I guess there's really kind of five factors that I'm gonna focus on if you're considering investing in industrial properties, warehouses. So uh, I was like starting off these videos with a bit of a, a background and a story. And then that way it essentially kind of, I think reinforces some of the points that I'm gonna make. So uh, not long ago, probably uh, middle of last year, I was looking at uh, a retail development that was on about 10 acres and there was an old um, 90,000 square foot, I think it was like a Sears uh, or maybe not even a Sears, uh, Zellers. And uh, we looked at that building and we were thinking, okay, what could we do with it? Um, and really there's not a lot of 90,000 square foot retailers. So we were looking at, could we convert this to an industrial building? And what we came up with after touring the building, looking at all the different specs, and I'm not gonna get into all the details, is there was four challenges, if you will, with that building. Number one, low ceiling height. I think it was about 14 foot clear. And I'm gonna get into ideally the, the clear height or span that you're looking for in new industrial buildings. It had poor loading, meaning uh, because the building was so big, and the way that it was configured, there was only a couple of places that you could actually load, meaning like where, where you could drop um, drop off or pick things up. Uh, the bay depth, it was way too deep. And the column spacing, I think the column spacing was really the biggest issue we had because quite frankly, that's kind of structural. And so in this case, I think the column spacing was about 14 or 15 feet. And, uh, and that was just gonna be uh, really too narrow uh, when you start to consider what industrial users are looking for, racking and, uh, and whatnot. So we determined that if we were going to um, purchase this uh, 10 acres, uh, that we were going to have to tear that building down. So uh, I'm going to give you now kind of five kind of key factors, if you will, that, uh, and I'm just looking at my notes here because I want to make sure that I stay on point, uh, for industrial tenants. Now, I guess like on a macro level, really what you're considering or what you're looking for and need to understand is who is your tenant and uh, likely what's going to happen is if you're investing in industrial properties, you're going to be working with an industrial broker and they'll be able to kind of guide you and say, okay, based on you know this city, this location, here's really what tenants are looking for. So this isn't meant to, I mean, I'm giving you like the macro look. And then what you need to do is like drill down based on the city that you're in, the demand, the gap in the marketplace, because generally speaking, there's always going to be a gap, right? Uh, what is undersupplied today? And I think tomorrow what I'll do is I'll talk about uh, an industrial building that I built up by the airport where there was a real gap in the marketplace. Uh, but I'll save that for tomorrow because I think it's important to kind of give you some of the technicalities or the, I don't know if that's even a word, but, but basically like, like the, the technical details of uh, investing in industrial properties. So uh, one, of the, one of the main variables or factors is going to be access. And really what access, what I'm talking about there is uh, like major roads, freeways, proximity to airports, rail, um, like, are you on a rail line or a rail spur? Uh, what about shipping? You know, like, especially when you're at, um, on port cities, that's very important. And then one thing that I don't think a lot of people would consider is proximity to workforce. Because at the end of the day, people, I know that, you know, these industrial warehouses are becoming more uh, automated. However, you, generally speaking, you still need people to get there. And so how close is it? to and how easy is it for uh, workers to be able to get there? Is there public transit? Is there buses? Is there LRTs? Uh, really, really important. And I think um, most investors don't think about that, but tenants definitely think about that because they're always worried about, okay, so how far is it for my workers to actually commute on a daily basis? And that has a big impact. So uh, number two are actually like the building factors, right? So we talked about location. Now we're going to talk about the building that's on that location. So the size of the bays. I mean, if you're in small bay, uh, that could be three to 10,000 square feet. If you're in larger bay, that could be 50 to 100,000 square feet. Uh, I would say that probably most people that are watching this and considering 
you're not competing with, um, I, I'm going to make that assumption, and maybe you are, but most industrial, um, like private investors are not on a big box, uh, big box being like kind of 25, 50,000 square feet. You're probably going to be in that smaller, maybe three to 10,000 square feet tenants or square foot tenants. Uh, next is ceiling height. Uh, I would say, generally speaking, it's going to be minimum 26 foot. Uh, if you're in smaller bay, you can get away with that. And I'm talking about new buildings, right? If you're in older buildings, sure, you're going to see, I don't know, probably, what would I say, um, uh, 16 foot, 18 foot. Uh, but if you're in a newer building, you're looking at 26, 32, 40 feet. Um, next is going to be loading, right? You've got dock level doors. And think of a dock level door, like if you've got those big semi trucks, 50, 53 foot trailers, can they back in? And that, that essentially when they back in, that's a dock level door. And then they generally have dock levelers, right? To go up and down to, uh, to be able to kind of get, get in and out and access that trailer. Or are you dealing with grade level doors, right? When we built our property, uh, the one in the Northeast, because we had like 1500 foot bays, quite small, uh, it was all grade level. But if you start getting into 5,000 square foot bays and up, you're probably looking at dock level doors. Um, cross dock is essentially where you've got dock level um, uh, loading on either side, or it could be grade level, but it's usually dock level. And, uh, and basically shipments come in one and then go out the other. So uh, those are uh, generally more rare and more expensive to build. Uh, as a rule of thumb, and this is only a rule of thumb, uh, you would be looking for like a minimum of one um, uh, dock or grade level per 10,000 square feet. I would say that even in the newer uh, industrial properties, I'm seeing like two per 10,000 square feet, but those are just kind of some, some considerations. Uh, structural support columns. So that's like the columns that are vertical and supporting the roof. You're looking for generally a minimum of 30 feet. Uh, and like I said, the building that we were looking at had kind of 14 feet, which was a real issue for us. Um, something else to consider is parking, not just for your staff, but also for um, the trucks that are coming in and dropping off trailers, right? Can they just drop off a trailer, go in, grab another one and take off? Or do they have to wait? So you want to be considering all those kind of variables. And obviously, I mean, it, it, I think it goes without saying, but um, I'm giving you kind of the macro so that you can almost like create your own little checklist when you go to a property, you can start to think about that. Obviously, if you're buying like, you know, a two acre property with, I'm just trying to think 40% site coverage, call it 40,000 square feet, you're probably not gonna be, like not all of these variables are going to come into uh, effect. However, uh, I think it's still important to kind of keep in the back of your mind so that you can ask a broker. And when you're thinking about that, uh, what it's going to do is brokers are going to a take you a lot more seriously because you've taken the time to kind of understand uh, the asset class and uh, and b they're going to make sure that they're only showing you properties that really make sense because the worst thing that can happen is to buy uh, an industrial property that's essentially obsolete where yeah you bought it and now um, you're the bigger fool because no one else <laughs> no one else wants it so that's what this video is really for is to kind of help you make sure that you don't make those kind of mistakes um, demand for industrial properties, I think it really kind of comes down to uh, a couple of variables here. So GDP, right? The value of the goods being produced locally. Um, one of these days, I'm going to try to get uh, a gentleman that I used to work with, Paul, uh, because he had done some very interesting research as it relates to, say, GDP in a city and how many square feet that city could support. So as GDP was increasing, say one or two percent, that would usually dictate uh, or or it would justify X number of square feet to be able to uh, come online in a market. And so, really, what that what what his and I don't know if it was a formula that was proven, but it was a, a theory and a hypothesis. And really, if you what he explained was, um, if you've got too much supply coming on and not enough GDP growth, you're going to have oversupply. And vice versa so just kind of something to consider um inventory holding this is going to be difficult to likely uh research or figure out yourself but you you know if you talk to a, a broker uh that's in the market and understands it and you're working on like i said big properties they're going to understand what the turnover rate is in those um industrial buildings 
Number three would be corporate distribution systems. So this is really on, uh, I would say this is maybe a little bit more in the US where uh, companies are strategically locating in very dense populations. And the reason for that is um, truck drivers are, are uh, regulated to, I think, no, no more than 14 hours of driving. And usually, what and they and they need to take certain amount of breaks, and so I think they're only allowed to drive eleven hours in a twenty-four hour period. So what that typically means is a short haul trip is going to be five and a half hours out, five and a half hours back, plus their uh, breaks. That means that they can go about three hundred miles. So what you would do is in your city, you would draw a three hundred mile radius, and that is essentially a one day trip for a truck driver, and that. Um, you'd be surprised, like certainly on a, on the more, uh, on the larger type of, uh, corporations, they will be looking very strategically on how and where to position their distribution centers because they want to be able to maximize that five and a half hour, uh, drive time. So just, you know, if you've never considered it now, you'll be able to start thinking, oh, okay, if I'm in Dallas, you can start to see, you know, in, a uh, in a, in a 300 mile radius, all the different cities that you can hit and what's the population density. Uh, I, I saw a great map and, uh, I, I don't know, you could probably just Google it where you could, uh, look at, um, North America at night and you can see where all the lights are. And what that really tells you is where the most or where the highest density of population and then, you know, just take that, overlay it on a, on a typical map and then grab your city and draw 300 um, uh, mile radius around it. And you can start to see what the population density would be in your city. Uh, <clears throat> next is globalization. And I guess the something that I, 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 I think would be important is you've got uh, when you when you read the write up, you'll be able to go into this in more detail. But in You've got port cities and then you've got like inland ports uh, as an example. So a port city would be, say, L.A. and then an inland would be Phoenix. Uh, similarly, in Canada, you might have Vancouver as a port and then Calgary as an inland. And the reason that's important is uh, for a few reasons. Number one, generally on the ports on the water, it is more expensive because land's at a premium. And so what's happening is you're seeing... Uh, basically shipments being dropped off in say LA or Vancouver, shipped to Calgary, unpacked, and then sometimes they'll go back to Vancouver because it's cheaper. And so you just want to kind of look at that and say, okay, so maybe I'm not in, uh, maybe I'm not on a port city, but maybe I'm in an inland, right? Houston would be another example of a port, but I think generally speaking, there's quite a bit of land down there. Um, and, uh, and, and whether or not your city could benefit because you're, close enough, if you will, by train, by rail, to drop those shipments off. So these are all just um, how to think about industrial, right? If this is really what you're you're considering, it's on a macro level. And then obviously, as you get into your city, then you'll start to look at location specific. Uh, and then last is logistics and supply chain. So I guess one of the um, hot topics these days is e-commerce and this concept of the last mile. And really the last mile is, you know, um, you know, for example, Amazon, right? So Amazon will have distribution centers in most cities now and even in smaller towns because what they want to do is that they want last mile delivery to the end consumer. And that's really where retail is being impacted. Uh, I don't believe retail is going to be uh, replaced by any stretch. However, if you can pay, uh, you know, lower rents and you can ship a lot more, right? Like if you've got an industrial building that's 26 or 32 foot clear, meaning you can stack vertical, it's much cheaper to store with very few people, you know, that, that are kind of required to operate. And then when you order a TV or you order whatever it is on Amazon, they're able to then go in, grab it, and then ship it out the next day, right? Because the last mile is all about getting that package to the end consumer as quick as possible. So just something else to kind of consider. Uh, those are really kind of the variables. And so just as a, a quick recap, if you will, you're looking at access, you're looking at the building factors themselves, you're looking at the demand fundamentals for industrial properties, 
Uh, you're looking at globalization, what's happening, and then last is logistics. So I think this was, uh, you know, for some people, they might really like this. For others, it's probably going to be uh, maybe a little bit boring. And so it just depends on whether or not industrial properties is something that you're considering. Maybe you're a user uh, looking to maybe expand or contract your business or you're looking to invest, right? Or maybe buy your own building. Uh, if that's the case and you're in Calgary, uh, certainly that's something that I could um, uh, help you with. And if you're in a different city and you're looking to connect with a broker, uh, let me know. Just uh, send me an email uh, if you're watching this on Facebook or um, on LinkedIn. Just send me a message. Uh, as long as you're serious and you're committed, uh, I will certainly put you in touch with, as long as I have a connection in, in the right city, uh, I'm happy to do that because that's, you know, as we know in, in commercial real estate, it is very much a relationship business. And so I can tell you that, you know, for example, I've got a client in, in Toronto right now and he's looking to invest in multi-bay industrial warehouses. I put him in touch with a gentleman uh, at CB Richard Ellis and uh, all of a sudden, uh, he's seeing deals first. He's seeing the right deals, and uh, and and you know uh, I, he hasn't um, found the right property yet, but he's well on his way. So uh, just something to kind of consider. So that's it for today. Uh, if you like the video, um, you know, or you're listening to this on a podcast, then just leave me a comment. Let me know what you liked about it, and uh, if there's certain things that you want me to cover in future episodes or videos, let me know. Uh, this is really about. Uh, delivering value that uh, you're looking for. And so if there's something that I didn't cover and you'd like to hear about it, as long as I have a, a knowledge or I can research it, I will be happy to do that. So that's it for today. Have a great one and we'll talk tomorrow. Bye for now.